Thank you for joining us at T-Cell Biology at the bedside. This is Dr. Elaine Husney. I'm a rheumatologist at the Cleveland Clinic, and I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our next case speaker, Dr. Greg Silverman. He's professor of medicine and pathology at the New York University Division of Rheumatology. He's a distinguished physician investigator who will be sharing with us today insights on the pathogenesis of RA and updates. He will specifically relate in a case-based format regarding gene environmental interactions and specifically looking at the role of smoking and the shared epitope, as well as a growing body of evidence linking oral health, such as periodontal disease and rheumatoid arthritis. Hello, I'm Dr. Greg Silverman, Professor of Medicine and Pathology at the New York University School of Medicine and co-director of the Musculoskeletal Center of Excellence, and I welcome you to our case report, The Curious Case of the Smoking Man. This is part of our greater program on T-cells, genes, and the environment in rheumatoid arthritis, which is brought to you by the Cleveland Clinic, R.J. Fassenmeyer Center for Clinical Immunology. Our learning objectives include, as a result of this participation, Participants will be able to describe the role of major histocompatibility complex as a risk factor for rheumatoid arthritis, describe the biologic function of MHC class II molecules in antigen presentation, and recognize how environmental risk factors such as tobacco and infection may interact with MHC and lead to the generation of autoantibodies and rheumatoid disease. Our patient today is Willie, who is a 55-year-old male carpenter referred by his general practitioner for a two-month history of bilateral hand pain and fatigue. You take a complete history, which we'll discuss later, and also perform a detailed physical examination. Pertinent positives is that you detect bilateral involvement of multiple MCP joints, proximal interphalangeal joints, as well as his first carpal metacarpal joint, with his right hand involvement greater than his left, and he has bilateral knee involvement, and all jo of these joints are tender and swollen. The first question is that you've ordered laboratory tests, but which of the following will not help to make the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis according to the acr ular 2010 criteria? A, rheumatoid factor. B, autoantibodies to citronated protein antigens, or ACPAs. C, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, or ESR, D, C-reactive protein, or CRP, or E, hematocrit and hemoglobin. The answer to this question is that you've ordered laboratory tests, and which is not helpful? Well, the incorrect answer is E, hematocrit and hemoglobin. The explanation is that hematocrit and hemoglobin, and even CBC with diff, are not part of the ULAR criteria. But the other tests are helpful. So let's look at the 2010 ACR ULAR classification criteria for rheumatoid arthritis. We can see that for the diagnosis, you need at least one joint with evidence of synovitis, but you actually exclude DIPs the first MTP and the first MCP joints, which we'll discuss a little bit later. Also, this is a diagnosis that is only made if you don't find evidence of an alternative diagnosis for the, uh, to explain the synovitis. And for this diagnosis, you need to have six or greater of the possible 10 criteria. And these are distributed into four domains, joint involvement patterns, serologic abnormality, elevated acute phase response, and symptom duration. So details are shown at right. Again, you need to have at least uh, one joint. And in fact, uh, you can get a maximum of five points if you have 10 or joints or greater. Uh, and this has to involve at least one small joint. For serologies, you actually get points for rheumatoid factors or for the presence of ACPAs. And this can be for a maximum of three total points if both RF and ACPA are positive at high titer. Symptom duration is less critical for a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis using these criteria. And in fact, you could potentially have the disease for less than six weeks, and you still could make enough points to be able to make the diagnosis. And with regard to blood tests, 
The only blood tests other than the uh, RF and ACPA are the presence of an acute phase reactant, CRP, or SED rate. So we can see here that uh, CBCs or hematocrit and hemoglobin are not relevant to these criteria. Question two, which hand joints are not commonly affected by rheumatoid arthritis? And there may be several answers that you might pick. Which are not generally uh, commonly affected by rheumatoid arthritis? A, distal interphalangeal joints, B, proximal interphalangeal joints, C, metacarpal phalangeal joints, D, first carpal metacarpal phalangeal joints, or E-wrist. Now, there was some uh, hints in the previous panel. So the answers that we're looking for, the incorrect answers, those, that, those joints that are not commonly affected by RA, are the distal interphalangeal joints and the first carpal metacarpal phalangeal joints. These joints are more commonly affected in osteoarthritis. Here, to better illustrate the distribution of hand involvement in osteoarthritis, we can see at left, the gray circles are showing you that, in fact, your thumb can be involved in osteoarthritis, your DIPs can be involved, and less commonly, your PIPs. In rheumatoid arthritis, it's a distribution which more commonly involves the MCPs and the PIPs with the DIPs being spared. And you can see that wrist involvement is very common. Thumb involvement doesn't help you with either of the, to discriminate between either of these two potential diagnoses. Now, di early diagnosis is, is important so that we can intervene therapeutically. And the reason for this is, if inadequately treated, rheumatoid arthritis can result in destruction of periarticular and articular structures, and this can result in deformities, as illustrated below. So this late-stage involvement shows a boutonniere's deformity of the thumb, as well as swan neck deformities of the fingers, and this has to do with both uh, bony destruction and, even more importantly, through erosions into the ligamentous sheaths so that the alignments of the fingers are no longer maintained and you get the ulnar deviation at the metacarpal phalangeal joints as well as these other deformities. So we, we hope to be able to make the diagnosis earlier so that we can intervene and prevent these kind of deformities. Moving on to question three, you have taken a very thorough social history. In which of the following facts about Willie may be relevant to understanding why he was susceptible to develop rheumatoid arthritis? A, when he was younger, he worked as a boilermaker in the Brooklyn shipyards, and there are environmental exposures potentially involved. B, he drinks red wine and prefers high tannin cabernets from Napa Valley. C, he has a fraternal twin sister who recently developed diabetes mellitus. D, he's been a smoker since age 17 and averages two packs a day. And E, he lives near high energy power lines and is often aware of the crackling noises when there is high humidity. Now, clearly not all of these are, have been implicated in uh, predisposition or development of rheumatoid arthritis. What is the most correct answer and which is most relevant to the development of rheumatoid arthritis? The answer is D, he's been a smoker since age 17 and averages two packs a day. And epidemiologic studies from Europe and Asia have shown that cigarette smoking is associated with increased risk of developing RA. Other aspects of Willie's history are really non-contributory. So to further explore this topic of cigarette smoking, which of the following statements, and one or more, may be true? A, cigarette smoking is associated with a twofold risk of developing rheumatoid arthritis. B, the more you smoke, the greater your risk of developing RA. C, there is a stronger association for developing RA in middle-aged men than in women. D, there is an equal contribution to risk of cigarette smoking for the development of seronegative RA as for seropositive RA. And this refers to uh, circulating rheumatoid factors or ACPAs. Or E, cigarette smoking is not as much of a contributor as drinking two glasses of red wine per day. So the re correct response uh, to these questions regarding epidemiologic surveys and cigarette smoking 
is that cigarette smoking is associated with at least a twofold risk of developing RA, and B, the more you smoke, the greater your risk of developing RA, and C, this association is stronger for developing RA in middle-aged men than in women. So in fact, response D is not true. Only seropositive disease is associated with tobacco abuse. And response E is not true. There is no risk that's been associated or correlated with alcohol consumption and no decreased risk either. Question five. So it turns out that Willie has a rather large uh, immediate family and Willie has an identical twin brother who in fact developed rheumatoid arthritis two years previous to his own development of the disease. This pattern of disease concordance in homozygotic twins has pre previously been documented and an identical twin of an individual with rheumatoid arthritis does have a greater risk for developing RA. So which of the following genes, one or more, have been implicated in the pathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis? A, estrogen receptor 2, B, MHC class 2, DR beta 1, C, TRAF 6, D, peptidyl arginine deaminase 4, or PADI4, or E, HLA, B26. So the correct answer here is MHC class 2, DR beta 1 genes, and there are a particular set of allelic variants that have now been implicated as uh, conveying increased risk for developing seropositive rheumatoid arthritis. And the strongest association, in fact, of all genes is with this structurally related set of DR beta 1 alleles. And together, these have been collectively termed the shared epitope. And that actually refers to these alleles have in common their, their carboxy terminus. So there's a shared structure. This structure is where peptides would normally bind during antigen presentation. So this theory was put together that these alleles together probably uh, or possibly might be presenting the same antigen or epitope, hence the shared epitope hypothesis. With regard to the other potential answers, PADI4 is false. That is not the correct answer. Uh, this is an isoform of an enzyme in the human body that is released at higher levels by activated white cells. And this enzyme alters the side chain and arginine amino acids in our own proteins at sites of inflammation. Although one inherited variant of this PADI4 was found to convey risk in some Asian populations, this association has not been found in Caucasians. So having raised the topic, this gives us the opportunity to explore in greater detail to explain what has been termed the shared epitope hypothesis. Now, this hypothesis was presented in 1987 in a commentary in Arthritis and Rheumatism, and they sought to address a seeming paradox that had been raised. It was great interest in the genetic uh, susceptibility factors that predisposed to the development of rheumatoid arthritis, but in different ethnic and racial populations, different allelic variants of MHC class II molecules had been implicated. This paper sought to better explain how different allelic variants could each predispose to the development of seropositive RA. And they took insights into the structural basis by which MHC class II molecules actually were expressed and then folded into antigen presenting molecules. And what they proposed was that there were actually structural similarities that were shared by all alleles that had previously been identified as RA susceptibility genes. And what they had in common were sequences that encode for what's here depicted as HV3, hypervariable region 3. And this is actually the site that it was later found which would fold and have direct contact with peptides that were being presented in the context of MHC class 2. These are being presented by antigen presenting cells to T cells, recruiting a T cell response, which in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis would be thought to be autoreactive. So this paper proposed that there were several MHC class 2 DR beta 1 alleles that each contributed to, to RA predisposition, and that these were related alleles that shared a common sequence encoding for the HV3 portion involved in epitope presentation for T cell recognition. 
So this study surveyed the genetic inheritance of 91 sets of Caucasian twins. Uh, these studies were done in the UK. And we should understand that rheumatoid arthritis prevalence is about 1% of the general population. Now, we know in these monozygotic twins, one or both will develop rheumatoid arthritis. When they looked at their inheritance of the shared epitope-associated alleles, if there was no inheritance of a uh, shared epitope, neither the uh, individuals uh, had a copy of this MHC class 2 allele associated with disease, their chances of becoming concordant for rheumatoid arthritis was 5% or 1 in 20. So this was five-fold increase from the general population. It suggests that there was other uh, genetic or environmental factors that contributed to them developing the disease. But importantly, if there was one copy of the shared epitope-associated allele, their risk went up, and they developed, in fact, 13% concordance. So this is about a two-and-a-half-fold increase of the concordance of the disease, both twins getting the disease compared to twins who did not have a copy of the shared epitope. Interestingly, there was a dosage effect such that if the twins inherited two copies, one copy on each of their chromosomal sets, there was 27% concordance. More than one in four, in fact, developed the disease, which was greatly increased from the general population. Take, taken together with uh, other data, it suggests that environmental factors uh, do contribute to the risk of rheumatoid arthritis, uh, but in fact, conversely, environmental factors uh, are not the sole contributor. Here we're showing that genetics and concordance in twins documents the very important contribution of inheritance. But it should be admitted that in the twins uh, that did not inherit a copy of the uh, allele associated with rheumatoid arthritis, at the time the study was done, other genes had not been identified, and it could well have been that their uh, increased occurrence of rheumatoid arthritis may also have re reflected environmental factors. So here we jump ahead to 2007. We see a panel from a seminal paper from Robert Plenge and colleagues that was published in New England Journal of Medicine. And what this shows is the results of uh, genome-wide scans of large cohorts of rheumatoid arthritis patients and uh, a group of controls that were otherwise gender and age matched. And what you can see on the x-axis are genomic intervals distributed to each of the 22 autosomal uh, chromosomes. And you can see also the X chromosome. The Y chromosome is not indicated because we know that this is not a male-limited disease. And on the Y axis, we show the uh, relative association uh, or uh, random risk that might be associated with these uh, genomic intervals. And what you can see is that, that the strongest association with the development of rheumatoid arthritis were genetic variants that were associated with the sixth chromosome. And this, in fact, confirmed earlier data showing that the strongest risk is associated with a subset of genes within the MHC class II locus. Now, a couple of other genes were also identified to have very strong association. Uh, they need to be uh, found above this gray bar because there are so many different intervals that are being examined. It's an excess of 20,000 different intervals. You might find randomly some association. Uh, but in fact, there were only three that really made this genome-wide scan uh, significant, and that was the uh, shared epitope-associated MHC class II-related alleles. There was also this TRAF1 uh, C5 variant, which relates to uh, cytokine signaling and also a gene variant called PTPN22, and this is a phosphatase, which we'll discuss uh, shortly. This relates to uh, thresholds for mononuclear cell signaling, very related to uh, immune responsiveness. So in question six, Willie wants to know more about his disease. He's very inquisitive, and he asks whether there's a potential interplay between genetic inheritance and environmental factors in RA pathogenesis. So, Variants of which of the following genes have been implicated as further increasing the risk of developing RA in cigarette smokers, specifically? A, HLA-DR beta-1, B, TRAF, uh, C5, C, PTPN22, D, mannose binding lectin, or MBL, or E, TNF receptor 1.
So to review the correct answer to this question, which of the variants of the following genes have been implicated as further increasing risk of developing RA in cigarette smokers? Well, the correct answer is that there's an interplay between DR-beta-1 and uh, PTPN-22 variants. And the correct answer is really the PTPN-22 variant. Uh, and no associations have really been reported with the other genes. Let me just explain this. Here in this panel, taken from a classical paper from the research group of Klaraskog and co-workers in Sweden, what they showed here was that cigarette smoking significantly increased the risk of developing RA, and this was in those that were genetically predisposed for the inheritance of MHC class 2 alleles and amplified by a particular variant of PTPN22 that controls signaling in immune cells. So let's just look at these figures. And what you could see at right, it had to do with uh, epidemiologic surveys and genetic characterization of a large number of patients that were seronegative. They did not have these ACPA antibodies. And it's small, but you can see that they typed them for the shared epitope, and they determined whether they had no copies, one copy, or two copies. And on the right side, they were looking at whether they were smokers or they had this variant of PTPN22 called R620W. So that's a mutation. And the point at right is that there was absolutely no association with this uh, shared epitope or with PTPN22 at right. And these did not interface with smoking to increase the risk of rheumatoid arthritis. We can see risk uh, that is in that vertical axis. So there was no variations. But at left, we can see that your risk of developing rheumatoid arthritis increased sequentially with one copy and then two copies of the shared epitope. But even more importantly, you can see that smokers, uh, which are at the back right two vertical columns in the city plot, smokers were at greatly increased risk, up to 25-fold risk compared to the general population. And it didn't matter what their PTPN22 uh, allele inheritance was, but you can see that in the red uh, vertical uh, building on the right, even if you were not a smoker, if you had this bad allele of PTPN22, you had a risk that was increased 15-fold or more compared to the general population. So this speaks to the interplay of genetics and smoking to, uh, with regard to risk of developing seropositive RA. And again, that's pr the presence or absence of ACPA or rheumatoid factor. And the effects were most additive if you had two copies of the shared epitope. And again, R620W is an allele of PTPN22 that increases the risk of developing rheumatoid arthritis, especially if you're not a smoker. Now we'll move on to question seven. During our interview with Willie, we discover that in the past, Willie has lost three teeth over the past four years, but he has denied trauma or a history of dental caries. He can't really explain why he lost his teeth. But this dental history may be relevant to understanding RA pathogenesis for which of the following reasons. A, periodontal disease is more common in patients with RA than the general population. B, periodontal disease causes rheumatoid arthritis. C, RA affects the gums and causes periodontal disease. D, the same bacterial strains that have been implicated in periodontal disease are also a major trigger of RA. Or E, the mean, the mean age of onset of RA is a decade before that seen in women. And this is because men don't floss as effectively. So let's consider these questions. And we see here uh, a panel that shows what may be the progression of disease, of periodontal disease, at the left upper hand corner. We see what healthy gums look like. Then at right, we see gingivitis, which shows uh, uh, mild inflammation uh, at, at the uh, margins with the teeth, and this can be associated with bleeding with flossing. And then the lower left hand corner, we see uh, retraction. Uh, of the gums from the tooth uh, margin. This is moderate periodontal disease, and then at right, very severe. So you can really see that the uh, roots of the um, teeth are exposed, and uh, there's great risk of tooth loss in the setting. With regard to our questions, in fact, the correct answer is that periodontal disease is more common in patients with RA. Uh, the other answers are really not true. Uh, there's no clear evidence to suggest 
that in fact periodontal disease causes RA. There's an association, but it is not clear that it's cause and effect. Uh, there's, it's not clear that RA directly affects the gums and causes periodontal disease, so this is also false. Uh, it is not true that the same bacterial strains that have implica been implicated in periodontal disease are a major trigger of RA, although this hypothesis is being pursued. And in fact, the mean age of onset uh, of RA in men is actually relatively later than in women. And there's no evidence to suggest this has anything to do with flossing. So let's just discuss this topic uh, in greater depth. Patients with long-standing active RA do have substantially increased frequency of periodontal disease compared with healthy subjects. Patients with periodontal disease have been shown to have a higher prevalence of RA than patients without periodontitis. But it's not uh, clear that this is really a cause and effect relationship, but this topic is under investigation. There are many parallels in pathogenesis between periodontal disease and rheumatoid arthritis. There's involvement of innate receptors that cause inflammation, like toll-like receptors. And there's the presence of chronic inflammation and osteoclasts that are involved uh, in health and remodeling bone and keeping it strong seem to be highly activated in severe periodontal disease, as well as can become activated in rheumatoid arthritis. And in both cases, this can result in bony destruction. And when it is activated in a setting of periodontal disease, can uh, result in tooth loss. Mouse models have been used to explore uh, this topic, and it's been shown that experimental arthritis can exacerbate periodontal disease in mice. But conversely, pre-existing periodontitis can exacerbate experimental arthritis. So again, these can be associated, they can amplify each other, but this doesn't really prove cause and effect, at least right now, and there's much to be learned about pathogenesis. Very recent paper uh, investigated uh, the potential relationship between periodontal disease and rheumatoid arthritis, and this was reported by uh, Jose Scher and coworkers in Arthritis and Rheumatism uh, in a recent issue, 2012. So this was a, a cohort a very recent onset rheumatoid arthritis patients within three months of onset, and they really were only modestly treated. They're only receiving at most uh, non steroidal anti inflammatories. And these uh, patients were evaluated for periodontal disease, and actually sampling uh, along their gum line was taken. And this allowed them to evaluate for the diversity of uh, bacteria that might be present to look for an association with certain potentially pathogenic bacteria. This technology uh, u utilized involved what's called massive parallel pyrosequencing of the DNA of the bacteria itself. It's really quite remarkable, and it avoids the requirement for actual culturing of uh, bacteria from any source, which could ultimately skew the representation. So Sharon and coworkers found, in fact, that the most advanced forms of periodontal disease was already present in individuals at the time of rheumatoid arthritis disease onset. They did find that the subgingiva microbiota, that's the collection of bacteria that are present on, of new onset rheumatoid arthritis patients showed a higher prevalence and greater abundance of Porphyromonas gingivalis, even at RA disease onset. So this is known to be the most common association of a bacteria and periodontal disease, and there have been questions whether or not there might be an association with rheumatoid arthritis. Again, this, this correlation of it, of it being uh, detected in the gums, and particularly in individuals uh, that had periodontal disease at RA disease onset is quite intriguing. However, these my microbiota differences could be attributed to periodontal disease severity and were not only found in RA patients. So other individuals with periodontal disease had the same uh, prevalence of P. gingivalis. Conclusion is that periodontal disease and the presence of certain characteristic gingival microbiomes uh, may precede the development of clinically overt arthritis and the relationship to ACPA-related autoimmunity that may precede arthritis by many years is still a topic under, under active investigation. So correlation, but not causation, but interesting patterns arising. So let's move on to question eight. Willie has become fascinated with understanding the topic of uh, pathogenesis of RA. So you familiarize yourself with the topic by attending symposia uh, at the annual rheumatology meeting, and you prepare yourself to explain pathogenesis as best you can. Which of the following statements is not true? 
A, peptidyl arginine deaminase, or PADI, has been implicated in RA pathogenesis. B, the anti-CCP test, or cyclic citrullinated peptide, detects antibodies to citrulline-containing protein peptides. C, experimental studies of MHC class 2, DR beta 1. Alleles associated with RA have shown that these bind and potentially are better for antigen presentation of arginine-containing peptides to T-cells. D, RA is a T-cell-driven disease, or E, RA is a B-cell-driven disease. So one or more of these uh, statements must be true, and one of them is not true. Looking for the uh, desired response, in fact, there is one of these statements is wrong. The incorrect answer is that experimental studies of MHC DR beta 1 alleles associated with RA have shown that these associated alleles bind and potentially are better for antigen presentation of arginine containing peptides to T cells. In fact, these in vitro studies showed that the binding of the shared epitope associated alleles are better at binding of citrulline containing peptides to T cells. So the pathogenesis of RA is complex and in fact may involve both B cells and T cells. So those are correct answers. Antigen presenting cells are postulated to use certain RA associated DR beta alleles, the shared epitope alleles, to present citrulline containing self peptides. And these peptides are believed to fit better into these presentation molecules than arginines. Arginine containing peptides are bulkier and more positively charged. So it is the citrulline containing peptides that are generated by exposure to the peptide, the peptidyl arginine deaminase enzyme that is released by activated white cells at sites of inflammation and infection. In this next slide, we better illustrate what we were previously discussing. So the PADI enzyme affects the side chains of arginine, amino acids, and proteins released from injured tissues. This is illustrated at left. There's an enzymatic change that pulls off this imine group, which is shown here with the, the nitrogen uh, associated with the left upper panel. And enzymatically, this is changed so that there's a covalent linkage to an oxygen molecule. And that's the difference between arginine at top and a citrulline at bottom. These are two different types of uh, amino acids that can be part of a larger polypeptide. And this relates to how well it can, a peptide that has either citrulline or arginine fits into this MHC class II binding groove, seen at right. So taken together, this peptide will fit into the MHC class II groove. Uh, here is just shown as ribbon diagrams, and you can see the peptide sits on the floor, and it's held in place by the uh, guardrails of these alpha helices, and when these are presented by antigen-presenting cells, uh, shown in number two, they'll be presented to a T cell that has the right kind of receptor that's going to see that peptide that's in that antigen-presenting cell, uh, MHC class two molecule at three, and this will result in activation of the T cell. The T cell can then activate a B cell, and the B cell presumably has a, uh, a citrulline peptide or citrulline protein binding antibody at surface, and it's going to be stimulated to make large amounts of these ACPAs. So as shown in this figure, arginines on peptides can be converted to citrulline by the enzyme peptidyl arginine deaminase in a setting of local inflammation. Peptides are processed by antigen-presenting cells, and then these antigen-presenting cells uh, will be able to have, in some cases, the shared epitope-associated MHC molecules that bind citrulline with high affinity. T-cell activation results from this antigen presentation. There is clonal expansion of T cells and cell-mediated immunity that provides help to B cells that have antibodies and produce antibodies to citrullinated antigens. And this results in the production of anti-CCP antibodies. Anti-CCP is one kind of ACPA, and these antibodies are highly specific for rheumatoid arthritis and as we saw earlier, are part of the criteria for the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. Therefore, in the current model of RA pathogenesis, helper T cells that recognize citrulline-containing peptides can provide stimulation of B cells that produce anti-citrulline protein antibodies, or ACPAs. All right, in this case report, we've discussed uh, much that is known about the pathogenesis of seropositive rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, many questions remain. 
how is periodontal disease associated with rheumatoid arthritis? And our goal, of course, is to avoid the deformities uh, and impaired quality of life that's, that is uh, illustrated in this picture at the upper, right upper-hand corner. Porphyromonas gingivalis is a major cause of periodontal disease, not just in RA, but in other individuals as well. This bacteria, in fact, makes an enzyme that acts like peptidyl arginine deaminase. It's structurally a little bit different, but it still generates citrullinated proteins, but it cites a periodontal infection. Scientists are now, therefore, investigating whether the altered citrulline-containing antigens induced by P. gingivalis can induce ACPA responses that later develop into seropositive RA. So I certainly hope that you found today's presentation informative and it's provided a better understanding of the pathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis and how molecular factors may contribute uh, to disease predisposition. And I hope you enjoy the other case reports and chapters uh, in this program. Thank you. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. I particularly enjoyed hearing about Willie and handling the complex questions in an ambulatory setting. I think, you know, understanding these in-depth molecular factors that can contribute to disease uh, predisposition has really helped us understand a little bit more about RA pathogenesis. The relationships between genetic susceptibility and environmental risk factors is really an exciting area of research. And Dr. Silverman has been able to synthesize a very complex issue in a rather simple manner through the case of Willie. He's really helped us understand the environmental factors that may interact with our genetic predisposition and increase our disease risk. Thank you, and I look forward to having you join us on the next T-cell biology at the bedside.